Hello, everybody, and welcome to this talk hosted by the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. My name is Ron Hasner. I am a faculty co-director of the Institute, and uh, sitting to my right is uh, Yossi Shane, uh, who's visiting from Israel. Uh, professor Shane is the Romulo Betancourt Professor of Political Science at Tel Aviv University, where he also serves as the head of the Abba Eben Program of Diplomacy and co-chair of the MA Program in Political Leadership. He's also a full professor of Comparative Government and Diaspora Politics at Georgetown University and holds visiting appointments at Yale University Wesleyan Fletcher School held at Wesleyan University Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Middlebury College, St. Anthony's at Oxford and uh, Princeton and Sciences Po. And he is here uh, primarily to talk about uh, this book here, uh, The Israeli Century, which uh, was a bestseller in Israel and is now uh, translated into English. Among uh, other things, in his uh, spare time, Professor Shane is a member of the Israeli Knesset for uh, the party uh, Yisrael Beitenu. Uh, he's been on our campus uh, for several days now, meeting with faculty and students. Uh, earlier today, the students in my Israel class had a delightful opportunity uh, to spend two hours in the company of a Knesset member and uh, asking questions about their research, about elections in Israel, about demography in Israel. So that's the, that's the great news. The more uh, complicated developments were uh, first the fact that the uh, public response and interest in this event uh, was, was overwhelming, caught us a little off guard. Uh, it's always hard in uh, the post-COVID era to sort of figure out how many people will show up for a live event. So we had to move away from our uh, room and cast this as a webinar, which means that we can now reach many more people uh, around the Bay Area, and we're also able to record it. Uh, and the other uh, less fortunate event is that uh, our guest caught a cold on the way here and is a little hoarse. So uh, we're, we're applying Yossi with tea. It is, however, also his birthday. So on that wonderful note, I'd like to welcome you, Yossi, and thank you for joining us. Uh, before we talk about the book, could you could you uh, tell me a little about your uh, your path from academia uh, to government and the process by which this book came about? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Ron, and I apologize for my horsey voice. <clears throat> I usually speak in a different fashion, but this will happen in the last two days with all those flights. <clears throat> I, um, I've been four decades in the academy. I'm doing what people in the academy do, research and writing and teaching. And I built the Center for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown. I was the Dean of the School of Government and International Affairs at Tel Aviv for many years. Um, and uh, over these years, especially in the last 15 years or so, um, I became involved from time to time with decision makers who called upon me to do certain things, including Mr. Lieberman, who was the foreign minister, and I was behind the scene advisor. And um, in fact, uh, during COVID time, Mr. Lieberman asked me to head a COVID team, which was of six professors. We were calculating and working from physicians to psychologists to law, et cetera, et cetera, producing lots of materials. And that's how we became kind of closer. And he approached me about joining him on the, uh, for the 24th election, which I did. And I became a member of Knesset um, in 21 and served on the uh, Security and Foreign Relations Committee. I'm the head of the Knesset subcommittee for higher education. I sit on the education committee. I'm the head of the Knesset delegation to the EU and the European Parliament and many such uh, uh, missions. And it's a full-time job. It is, and, and how is that transition from academia to policy making? Is that, is that difficult? Does <laughs> it require a new skill set, or did you find that the skills that you had acquired as a political scientist uh, were, were handy and useful? I will tell you that two things I will say. First, it was quite a smooth transition <clears throat> into politics because I was not a regular politician. I didn't have to compete 
in the primaries or, you know, I just joined the list. Um, but um, as I joined politics, and I also was a member of the coalition, governing coalition, it became clearer to me all the time that politics is divided to two things. One is doing things. The other is, and it's not less important, <clears throat> is constantly uh, selling yourself on the media and especially the, the web. So like, and you, you will be surprised how many politicians are constantly preoccupied with the Twitters, with the TikTok, with the uh, Facebook, and are pushed by their assistants constantly to be there. So this was not exactly to my temperament. And I don't think that I still adjusted. So um, my assistants constantly tell me that I'm a boring politician. I don't create any provocation. I don't make any pronouncement people uh, generate uh, discussion. The politics in Israel has become very toxic become very, um, I would say, violent in terms of the usage of words. Fake news, you know, from this country as well. So um, this was um, a revelation to me how deep we are in this uh, process. So speaking of provocation, uh, uh, tell us a little about uh, why you decided, here, I'm gonna hold it a little closer to the camera, why you decided uh, to write this book, which is really quite provocative. Uh, this is the English version, which you tell me is a little different from the Israeli version. Bit, just for uh, several, added some stuff with the American audience, maybe. Right. So, so before you uh, tell me the thesis, tell me a little about why you decided to write the book. And in the meantime, I'd like to encourage our audience to please type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. And in a couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to stop asking my own questions, and I will start reading out uh, your questions uh, to, to Professor Shane. So why this book and what is it about? Like many projects that one engage with, you don't know, always know what will be the product. And when I started, um, I was not exactly knowing where I'm going. I am a scholar. I've written several books on diaspora politics and kinship ties in international affairs, how they inform international affairs in conflict, in, econ in economics, in religion, et cetera. And always the Jewish example was in the back of my mind, but I haven't dealt with the Jewish example. I wrote about many other cultures. And I've written about America. I wrote a book on marketing the American creed abroad in the 1990s about how, Amer how Americans relate to the countries of origin or symbolic homelands. And I've witnessed something which was very interesting about Israel, the people who were known for many, many, many generations as diasporic people exilic are becoming more concentrated. And in fact, everything they do is impacted by their sovereignty and the state itself. And this process has impacted many Jews around the world, which I call the Israelization of Judaism in many ways. And this subject, which first took me to France and to England and to other countries, just to write about their communities, Eventually, I decided I want to do something more because I saw a phenomenon which I thought is unique in Jewish history. So I started to become a student of Jewish history during the seven years of, of work. <clears throat> and I decided I wrote a book, not about the 2,000 years of exile. I went 3,000 years back and trying to see from the time of the first temple all the way to the second temple, all the way to now, what happened to the Jews when sovereignty and statehood and politics and power impact them more than anything else and how it shifts so many issues they deal with, how it shifts their culture, how it shifts their relations to religion, how it shifts the relation between diaspora and homeland in terms of leadership, in terms of the idea of who speaks on behalf of the Jews and with what authority, and basically on questions of morality and many, many more, more questions. So what I did is a tour of history back and forth and trying to draw from contemporary issues into the past. For example, when I studied the Babylonian exile, a very important period in Jewish history, I took from my previous work, two books I wrote on the exile politics of our generations, and I brought them back to see, to check, and it was remarkable to me to see the parallels, especially in light of the fact that so many new data 
has been gathered in the last two decades, especially in the Babylonian exile. So I take a three, a 3,000 years journey in trying to see what happened to the Jews when statehood, politics, and power is informing them and the majority of the Jews now residing in Israel or soon to be residing in Israel, which is a mega event in Jewish history. And this has lots of influences on other people's religion, on the impact on Christianity, on the Catholic church, on evangelicals, on the Muslim world. It was quite remarkable to see on world economy with Israel's high tech, lots of things happened which I saw as relation to the emergence of sovereignty. And of course, vis-a-vis -vis the diaspora and American diaspora in particular. So, so explain the title of the book, The Israeli Century. Um, yeah. what, what's, the, what's the title and, and what's the thesis in, um, as, your, as your aide at the Knesset uh, asks you again and again, uh, in, in, most, in your most provocative the, terms? The, the thesis was uh, built um, in, uh, I wouldn't say against, but against the back, back, uh, backdrop of another book, which was published two, almost 20 years ago, yeah. uh, 20, I think in 2004, by a scholar, a very good scholar, historian Sleskin, which he called it the Jewish century, which he basically talked about how modernity was shaped by the Jews and how the three major experiences of Jewish life in the 19th and 20th century one is Russian Empire, the second is the United States, and the third Israel has evolved and reshaped modernity and the Jewish people themselves. And in his thesis, the, the, the place of the Jews in Israel will be secondary to the place of the Jews in the United States because of the openness, the United States, the Golden Medina, the state that provided security, that provided uh, integration, that provided economic well-being, that provided, um, let's say, um, uh, not only a deep sense of belonging, but also perhaps freedom from anti-Semitism. That was his idea. He made the point that it will create a vibrant Jewish community that will supersede the Israeli community, which was too parochial, um, dealing with wars which are outdated, et cetera, et cetera. And I made the point, not in order to be triumphant or anything like that, it is completely uh, uh, overshadow or perhaps uh, uh, what it does, it's, it's, it's a misrepresentation of reality. I talk about the rich uncle from Tel Aviv and I showed how the gravity of Jewish life has moved from New York to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and how in every aspect of life, the vibrancy of Jewish life now emanates from, 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 from the sovereignty, sovereignty of the state. It doesn't mean that the American community is not vibrant, that things are not happening, you know, but by and large, I would, I would ask your audience right now, and this will be one of the questions I was asking, if they can even name two names of role models, Jewish role models in America now that everybody can agree upon, everybody knows even, so uh, it's clear cut that the Jewish state provides questions that were absolutely cannot be dealt with in the diaspora communities on ethnicity, on religion, on question of power, on question of Jewish morality, what it means at all even, on questions of the, the, the type of the Jew that was created in modernity. He was talking about the agility. I'm talking about agility with a home to come back to and why the startup nation is becoming so successful because of the strength of the sovereign state and many more such issues. And I'm taking it back and forth, showing that this was exactly the same, for example, at the time of the Maccabees, the, the, the time of Jewish sovereignty in the second century, the 80 years of Jewish sovereignty, when the diaspora suddenly became subservient of the, of the rule in, in, the, in the Holy Land, after many decades that they were kind of away, including what happened to the Jews of Alexandria, including what happened in Jews everywhere, in fact, in Babylon eventually. So this is what I was doing in the book. So, so uh, elaborate on that a little. Why, what is the use of going back to, uh, you know, as you say, 3,000 years, 
to study the first temple, the Assyrian exile, the Babylonian exile. What does it teach us about the status of Israel in the world today? It teaches us about how ethnicity and nationalism is a core issue in defining peoplehood in a very, very, um, I would say, uh, different manner that these people have defined themselves and saw themselves in other countries of domicile, including their engagement. It's clear cut that for many, many generations, the Jews could not be part and parcel of other communities. It took them many generations to be part of them. They were, I'm talking about religion, why they've been, uh, after the collapse of the second temple, what happened? What happened to them in the dispersions, many, many places of dispersion, where they could not even hold the position of spokesperson, the rather gravel, the idea of shtadlanim, this was the politics. Only in the modernity was the idea of emancipation. The Jews started to believe that they can be part of the societies in which they dwell. And we all know the story that this, especially the American example, was a massive example of that event. And even there, I would say, this example has been running against the backdrop of what you call assimilation, intermarriages, the difficulty of maintaining ethnicity, the desire to adjust your identity to the American definition, the, 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 the difficulty of maintaining the cohesiveness of the community and the voice and the impact that you have over the years. While in Israel, the society has grown in terms of numbers from 600,000 Jews in 1948, a meager number in comparison to the United States, to 10 million, among whom 7 million are Jews now, another half a million are Jews, but not defining the Jews. This is another very interesting story because we, as you very well know, there's the very idea of Jew by the law of return, the entitlement to become a member of the state because we have to Jewish heritage, and the, the, the Jew according to halakha, which is the religious aspect. And I'm dealing with these aspects. Back and forth, what happened in, in, after the Babylonian exile? What happened when, when Judea uh, is being conquered by the Maccabees and they convert the whole system? Everybody's being converted, including Herod, to become later on the Roman king. And I show how this impacts on our day, daily life and what is happening now. But I also deal extensively with what is happening in Israel itself, how this experiment have basically shaped the Israeli life and is continuing to shape it between religious and secular, between Ashkenazi Jews and Mizrahi Jews on issue of geopolitics on, and the questions of, of, of culture. For example, in literature, I write a lot about how there was a kind of like the, the, uh, the golden era of Jewish literature in the diaspora, but now there is no more golden era of Jewish literature. There are many Jewish authors who are writing but Jewish literature emanates from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. If it's Amos Oz, if it's Aleph Bet Yoshua, if it's Meir Shalev, and many more like this. And, 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 and the references, whether you like Israel or not, and that's not you have to like Israel. In fact, criticism of Israel itself is an a proof that it's very difficult to retain certain degree of ethnicity and, and interest in the Jewish life in the diaspora without Hearkening without looking into Israel, even, even, even criticizing Israel. So this becomes the reference point. And above and beyond, of course, leadership. Where are the Jewish leaders? How they are being, how they are being built? In what, in what, in, in what uh, 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 capacity? Religiosity. Where are the rabbis being trained? Which rabbis are being trained? All the denominations, Jewish denominations in America, of course, the Reform and the Conservative. Um, but the orthodoxy, what happened to the orthodoxy? You go to France, it's all impacted by the Israeli rabbinites. The European rabbinites are Israeli rabbinites. The, the British rabbinites, all the rabbis who once trained in Britain are now trained in Jerusalem. Lots of things happen. And that kind of has lots of, and the people abroad in other countries also see why they used to talk about the Jewish question or the Jewish problem. Now it's the Israeli issue. Even in anti-Semitism, it's all kind of like you to the Israeli, it's been the BDS 
on sort of like the, uh, the, the anti-Zionist campaigns, whatever, Israel, and of course, Israel is becoming the, uh, I would say, the uh, sole almost arbiter on Jewish memory. When Israel is signing agreements with Poland against, you know, they signing agreements with Poland and people can be uh, upset about it. Why do you do that? Um, this is not only to Israel, it's in other diasporas where the um, uh, Armenian government signed a deal on the Armenian genocide with Turkey, the diaspora is in arms. But the diaspora in Armenia is much stronger than the people in Armenia because it's a very weak state. While Israel is becoming the stronger state. This has not been the case in the 50s. Albeit from the early 50s, Ben Gurion claimed that he speaks for, on behalf of all the Jews around the world. And every, but every Jewish issue is now governed by Israel. And indeed, in that respect, uh, not that every Jewish issue in New York or California is governed by Israel, because these are communal issues, but the larger issues, the larger discussions, the larger concerns are basically impacted by what is happening in the sovereign state, in its politics, in its culture, in its industries, and in its military behavior. So, so that's great. So, but, but now I have a political science question. Uh, so you, you make it very clear in the book that this is not just uh, a, a, a happy story of the Jewish people returning to their home, but that, that sovereignty does something yes. to Jewish thought, yes. identity, sure. creativity. So, so can you, as a political scientist, say, what does exile do to Judaism? And, and what does sovereignty do to Jewish being? Excellent, thank you. First of all, exile allowed them to try to move from ethnicity to religiosity. And that's how what informed the world, world affairs, including world religion. From the time of Babylonian exile, the seed of Israel has become the holy seed because they had to retain the community in the absence of political echelon. And they moved to define themselves more according to prohibitions, according to the practices uh, 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 in the community that are devoid of other sacri sacrifices in Jerusalem, in the temple, or in terms of a, of, of, a, of a country fighting for its borders, fighting for its life. And that began very early on. In fact, the Jews who returned to the Holy Land uh, with the Persians uh, never returned to a sovereign state. They returned to an autonomous kind of like existence under Ezra and Nehemiah. I show what is the autonomous existence. And they cherished the idea of religiosity. Once sovereignty was regained, religiosity took a second step or was redefined by the political echelon. Things like that has happened in Israel also, but now we're seeing a trend where religious and religious Jews and religious Zionists and ultra Orthodox trying to take a, a, a very a very deep uh, a, a chunk of it, and this is a very interesting evolution. Second, exile and diaspora, especially in modernity, has created a creed, a Jewish creed, which people talked about, let's say, Jewish morality, and they were hearkening back on Jewish morality of the prophets. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's idea that she is a Jewish jurist because she is following the notion of tzedek, tzedek tildof, justice, justice you will pursue, kind of like this is the heritage. And what I'm saying is that morality is being shaped and reshaped today for a variety of reasons, by the need of the state of Israel, by the challenges of the state, by the fact that the state is more, more geared toward the question of power and military and, and might rather than powerlessness, which defines morality in completely different terms. And I show this kind of like rupture in terms of realpolitik, which has no niceties of morality. When you have thousands of people in Gaza jumping and following sort of the border or in, on Syria, these are not at all moral questions that were asked in the diaspora and exile where, where the Jews were always the, 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 uh, the people who were uh, who were the victims of power. Here the Jews are the powerful and that defines politics and defines morality. And I wanted to go back and check what were the tenets of this morality. 
So there is a long chapter about how Jewish morality was created from biblical time to later time and how it was reshaped by Halakha, by the poor, by the Shulchan Aruch, and how it was regained in Israel on the issue of the military, whereby uh, the, the rabbis who started to build the military uh, uh, and redefine the, 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 the war rules, re redefine the attachment, Rabbi Cook, Rabbi Gorin, are essential for understanding this kind of religiosity, which became very much imbued with Zionism. So there were late comers to Zionism, but they're very much taking over it and adjusting religion into it, which is very interesting. So, so, so help me understand what you mean when you say that the center of gravity of Judaism has moved towards Israel. What does that look like? It looks like, first of all, the people in the world uh, you, uh, relate to the Jews as such, qua Jews, via Israel. You know, if you have the Abraham Accords, if you have European relations, I'm in charge of European relations uh, with the Knesset. So, of course, it deal with anti-Semitism in there, but basically the talks, all the talks about geopolitical manner, memory, uh, uh, intellectual discovery, are with Israel. And even American Jewish organizations who are involved, like American Jewish Committee, which is the, the most significant one, always do it through the prism of Israel's interest and Israel's design and Israel's claims. And even if we, you know, they, so they, they, uh, even when they, they fight anti-Semitism, they, they understand very well that they cannot separate between this anti-Semitism, let's say of the past, Christian hatred, whatever hatred here, and the Israeli situation. So this is a very important factor to, for them to understand. So all major organizations, Jewish organizations today, are one way or another attached to Israel, including the Reform Jews. Reform Jews were the most important movement in American Jewry, religiously wise, at least in the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century. And for them, the, 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 the decree was that the, we are not a nation. And that was the preamblem of the, of the Reform Jews. Nowadays, to say the Jews are not a nation is to negate Israel's right to, to, to a to state almost. While they did so perhaps in the early 40s when Israel was, when Israel was moving toward independence, today the reform movement is completely Zionist. In fact, adopted it in its tenets and its creed that Zionism is our number one mission. And, 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 and to, in order to substantiate itself in the United States, they have to build themselves in Israel first. And this is a huge development. And, and, or, or Christianity, for example. Look what happened to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was the Nostaitate, which was uh, issued in the early 60s about the relation with the Jews. Everything now is not relation with the Jews. It's relation with Israel. And the fact that the Pius X was against the creation of a Zionist state because you betrayed our Messiah, as he said, to Herzl. The fact that the current Pope comes to visit in Israel and lay a reef on the tomb of Herzl was defined by one of the bishops, and to me, in Washington, Father uh, McManus, as the most important evolution in, in, in Catholic life since the Reformation. And so with the evangelicals, with, you look at theologians and so on. So these are very important developments that people don't pay attention to, but they're all through the prism of what the state of Israel does or not. Great, so I have some, I have some uh, pushback against that, but before I do that, I would like again to remind people to please type their questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom. Uh, before I read uh, some questions from our, uh, from our uh, many viewers, I'd like to invite uh, our fellow Abby Steinmetz to ask a question. Uh, those of you who are familiar with our institute know that we have uh, scores of undergraduates who work closely with our uh, researchers. Uh, sometimes teach classes of their own, sometimes do research of their own on Israel. Uh, Abby, can you uh, join us and ask your question, please? Yes, Unmute yourself. Um, Good. Hello, my name is Abby. Um, I'm currently a senior at Berkeley studying nutritional science, but have a passion for the Institute and everything. Um, so thank you for visiting us. It was definitely interesting to hear everything that you had to say. Um, I think my question kind of relates back to American Jewry, specifically like young American Jew, Jewish 
students or just Jews in general. Um, and you really mentioned like you kind of the tie between Judaism and Israel is so strong. Um, and I'm curious what you have to say either like going forward for young American Jews, like what it looks like um, post diaspora and everything. And also if you feel like there is a necessary component to having like an education, kind of like knowing what's happened happening in Israel as a young American Jew, because um, I know like even at Berkeley, especially like some people don't want to engage in that. Um, and what would you say to that? First of all, thank you, Abby. Um, when you look at that, and I'm also was a professor at Georgetown for many decades, as you know, American, young American Jews often wrestle with their own identity in the society of multiculturalism and uh, the, the idea of, of how they, what they see that their community, their relations to their uh, kin community in, in, in religion, and also in terms of like intermarriages, that is in a very uh, big, big issue. How you, how are you going to build yourself? What do you build, going to build your community? Uh, there is certainly an understanding among American Jews, as, especially the young, but um, of course the older one that some degree of connection to Israel helps to nourish this identity. It's not by mistake that you have birthright Israel established by American Jews. This was they were the one who basically, um, uh, what's his name, Starnart and uh, Schusterman, and I forgot, uh, I don't want to do injustice to the Canadian family. Um, I will remember in a second. They understand it's not like a magic wound uh, that you come to Israel in two weeks trip, that you gain identity, but it certainly helps to have this relations to the massive collection of Jews that are in the sovereign state of Israel to see what is happening. And this is a very important factor. Secondly, it's the language. Uh, I think that eventually there will be a need uh, to, 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 to push this language, that people will speak the Hebrew language more. The Israelis, of course, the intellectuals speak the English language, but the, the Hebrew language will be important. It has become important even for the ultra-Orthodox who's trying to shy away from the Hebrew and spoke Yiddish as a negation of the Zionist project. Um, I think that the experience of American Jews is such that you have to fight for your identity. You constantly have to fight for it. You have to preserve the holidays. We are coming to Rosh Hashanah, where I'm going to go to shul. I don't go to shul. Uh, do I, what do I do? How do I preserve it on campus or off campus? Israel has provided kind of like a hub that you don't have to ask these questions. It's in the calendar. You preserve it one way or another. Either you go to the beach or you go to the synagogue, but you're there. So this is a big challenge for young American Jews. And I uh, have seen it in my own house. My kids were raised in America. And this is a very important issue that Israel basically is... Uh, is, is a major source in strengthening these ties, even if you criticize Israel, that's what I'm saying. You have a point, you have a position, you're part of something larger than the individual existence of most American Jews, of course, with the exception of Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox in the United States, which are the fastest growing communities in the United States. Thank you, Abby. Um... Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, read a question now from uh, one, one of our guests uh, in the audience. Uh, Floor uh, asks about a uh, possible declaration by uh, Yair Lapid uh, supporting uh, a Palestinian state at the United Nations, um, uh, suggesting that is, Israel will uh, in the future exist uh, alongside the Palestinian state, so a, a, a two-state solution declaration. Um, Flora would like to know whether this is uh, significant. Is it different from uh, any other pronouncements? Um, I haven't heard of this pronouncement, but maybe you have. Um, I can tell you uh, that the pronouncement, there is a level of um, rhetoric versus reality. Um, and right now, I will start with the reality. Very few in Israel, left and right, right, of course, sometimes from ideological uh, um, from ideological conviction, but even the left, Meretz, uh, Labour Party, who are speaking about the two-state solution, 
are constantly in, in the quagmire because they don't know how to build it. They don't know how to create monopoly over the means of violence among Palestinians in the West Bank. What does it mean? They don't know how to draw the boundaries. They don't know who is the partner to talk to, the PA or Hamas. They have difficulties. And yet they have to pay homage to the idea of two-state solution they feel because they don't see any other solution, let alone the fact that Arabs in the West Bank, albeit governed by the Palestinian Authority in areas A and B, because the West Bank is divided, still not living in a democratic, vibrant state. But none of the Arabs in the Middle East live in a democratic, vibrant state. It doesn't mean they don't want to. Uh, so this is a, uh, also in relations to the administration of the United States. The United States had a former administration, uh, Mr. Trump and his team that came with an interesting plan, I must say, one of the most interesting plans. It's not by mistake that the right wing in Israel became the greatest enemy of the Trump plan. They loved Trump, but they didn't like Trump plan. And it, it, because the Trump plan was also talking about two state solution. So they liked Trump because he, rec he recognized basically uh, many of the settlements which were built already, but he didn't know how to move away from the idea of division of the land. And the Palestinians, of course, did not accept it because for them it was not enough. Right now, Biden wants some of this rhetoric. Yael Lapid may pay homage to this, but I don't. I would make much of it, especially leading into the next elections, when all indications show that this is not on the top of the agenda of the Israelis. Quite interesting, number four or five or six element in the Israeli, uh, as Israel is moving to vote, the question of the Palestinians is not on their agenda as much, which is very interesting. So could you, uh, you, you speak about this a little in the book, too. could you explain to us what you think the, the, the top concerns on the minds of Israelis are now that we're going into election number five yeah. in, the last few, in the last few years? Economics is a very important subject. State and religion is a very important. Say, say a couple of sentences about each of those. Economics, you know, Israel is a very vibrant economy with GDP per capita reaching this year 50, uh, thousand dollars, one of the richest countries in the OECD. But there is huge disparities between those who are part of the engine of the economy, the high-tech engine, and who are, set, who, are, who are congregating in the center of the Tel Aviv area, and those who are more in the periphery, and the youngsters who cannot buy apartment. Everything is the rise of prices. Uh, so this is a very big issue in Israel, for Israelis, how they navigate this economy on the one hand, they're doing well, they become exposed to the world, they travel all over the world. On the other hand, they, 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 they don't think that it's a spread uh, in, in an equal fashion in society, whatever equality means here, we wanted to spread. The second issue is state and religion. Uh, there is a growing number of ultra orthodox in Israel. This year, September 1st, as we opened the schools in the Knesset, I gave a speech about the fact that almost 29% of first graders in the Jewish community are ultra-Orthodox, whose parents barely recognize the Zionism, barely work in the workforce, and basically doesn't study what we call core studies of English, computer science, math. This is a major, major issue into the future, how Israel will be shaped because of this, this, this incredible growth of the ultra-Orthodox community. A man, 74 in the ultra orthodox community, on average will have 52 offsprings, which is quite remarkable. A secular, whatever you mean by secular, but regular Israeli will have nine, maybe 10. This is a massive, massive shift of population that we are experiencing. Of course, there were also massive migration from the former Soviet Union. Even this year, we got 50,000 new migrants from Ukraine and other places. So this sometimes, but this is a big issue. Uh, third issue, as I uh, uh, suggested to you, which is very much on the minds and hearts, is the idea of the uh, Tel Aviv in Jerusalem, and like the culture of Israel, where the culture of Israel is going. So it doesn't mean that the Palestinian is not an, an issue. And when it erupts, it's a big issue. But the issue of Arab-Israelis is a much bigger issue. <coughs> how much integration Israelis are willing and wanting Jewish Israelis 
to of the Arabs to be and vice versa. On the one hand, there is a large process of Israelization among Arab Israelis. On the other hand, there is still the idea of a Jewish state. So this is a big issue as well. Um, because of the um, fact that Israel has now had peace agreements with Egypt, with Jordan, with all the Emirates in a very elaborated relations. And, and, and even with Saudi Arabia, we have good relations. Uh, change the Middle East significantly. I was last week with the foreign minister of uh, Dubai and Israel with the, with, the, with the president and everybody else. And it's quite remarkable to see tens of thousands of Israelis visiting the Emirates on a weekly basis with over 20 or, or 60, I don't know how many flights a day, which is crazy. So uh, this put the Palestinians and the Palestinians themselves have been bifurcated have not been able to present a uh, unified kind of like leadership and the claims have been, so this is a big issue that will, but it's not, as long as there is no kind of like the terrorism is down, it's not a big issue for Israelis. Uh, please have another sip of tea while I call on Alexander Beck, who's another uh, fellow, undergraduate fellow of our Institute uh, to uh, ask a question. Hello, Alexander. Good evening. I am a, an undergraduate senior history major. My question is, what are the broader mid and long term implications of the Israel century on diaspora Jewry in America and in Europe? I think the broader implication will start with Europe. It's clear cut that the two big Jewish communities which are left in Europe right now, which is France and Britain, have been completely, and but I'm saying completely, was very mean, Israelized. Everything is tied to Israel. In fact, in France, there is what they call Boeing Aliyah. One foot here, one foot there, they come, they live, they live vicariously to Israel. There is a very interesting process in France with the Jews of France who wanted to integrate, who wanted to take emancipation as the core, are no longer talking in these terms, either the CRIF or, 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 or the, uh, uh, all other institutions. There is no room because of the changing nature of France in the same language. Israel is the key factor there. In Britain, of course, there is still leadership, Jewish leadership of the community. There is a chief rabbi, my community also is depleted. We're talking about less than 300,000 spread between London and Manchester and other places. But they're taking their kids to Israel in the age of 17. All of them are taking their kids to Israel to study in the age of 17. If you talk to the mothers, and I spoke, I did some survey, they basically understand that their kids will end up in Israel one way or another, or will have, they don't, they don't think and act with the British future in their minds in the same fashion that perhaps you had in the past, that Montague uh, uh, rejected the Balfour Declaration. No, this is a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fact. It doesn't mean that there will not be Jewish life. We saw what happened with Corbyn. We saw what happened in the Labour Party. We see other things happen. I think even there, it's always in relations to Israel. Um, and this is very important to remember. It's not just British anti-Semitism of Corbyn, it's the relations to Israel and the language there. Uh, with, relation, with relations to the United States, America is much larger diaspora spread from California to the East Coast. But even there you see changes taking place, including, for example, the empowerment of the Israeli diaspora in America, whose organizations that disseminate Israeliness into the community. Now, lots of things depends on the economic well-being. Uh, if Israel is an attractive place, so you have people will not go back to United States in many ways. Israelis were used to go. America was the dream for them in the 50s and the 60s. It was even kind of a saying, the last before the Six-Day War, the last will turn the light 
before he leaves, you know, because America was the, uh, the, the land of opportunity. This is not anymore how Israeli sings, which is quite interesting. First of all, they earn money, the way Americans, including in the academy. I, I spoke to, uh, I, I, I spoke uh, about it here with my host about it. It's a completely different story. So um, these are some of the manifestations of that. Because America is so large, community is still intact one way or another. Um, this is not, I wouldn't say it's a war of attrition, but it's a process whereby America will be second to the sovereign state of Israel, unless there will be calamity. Many people I write in the book speak in these terms. They have the whole paradigm of exile and return as the paradigm of the Jewish people. That when we become, we become powerful, some disaster will come, and again, the state of Israel will not survive. I don't want to make predictions, but I think it's very unlikely into the near future. It was the Iranian threat, with all of that stuff, there is kind of a very vibrant society which is growing, growing fast. We're the fastest growing community in the world, which is quite interesting, with fertility rates of Israeli women, not because of just the ultra Orthodox, reaching 3.2 per woman. This is quite remarkable. Our fertility rates in the diaspora declining. The third point is, of course, the religion. The ultra Orthodox communities are growing, taking greater shape. For them, loyalty to the state is always problematic. But in Israel, they will have to, to take charge of the state and people asking them, what will happen if you will be the majority? Who will fight? What you will do? Are you going to govern instead of studying Torah? These are big questions that will have to be answered. And uh, I don't know if they're ready to answer them, but uh, it's, it's creeping in. To the discussion, yes. Thank you, Alexander. That was a that was a great question. Um, so 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 here's 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 one possible pushback. So if, if your argument is that Israel is sort of slowly becoming the center of gravity of the Jewish people, um, your critics might say that might be the view from Israel. No, but it's sort, a, it's sort of a it's sort of a sort of a myopic view, biased by by your loyalty to Israel and the fact that you serve in the Israeli Parliament. Uh, and, and your hope that Israel may indeed become uh, a center of gravity. So are there, talking political scientist to political scientist, are there objective, objective, measurable indicators that the center of gravity is moving, empirical indicators that, that are hard to argue with? All, all of them. I don't see any anyone that indicating differently. There was a whole discussion and some people kind of invented data about Israel moving, that the Israeli sort of like state will be majority of Arabs about the, um, Shaul Magid wrote a book about uh, post-ethnic America, how they organize their life. The only question I'm asking, it's not from a triumphant point of view, it's a reality, it's a Czech reality. What is the American Jewish model of life or the British Jewish model of life? The diaspora model, I present all the models that emerged in the 19th century in modernity be it the model of communism and the Bund, be it the model of uh, the, the kind of like the universal diaspora of the German type, be the model of autonomy, which was, uh, what's his name? My mind uh, betrays me now. Um, so I, uh, of, of Jewish autonomy in other countries, all these models have been, have failed in many ways. The American experience, of course, has been successful, but facing great challenges of maintaining the model of Jewish life in America, the gravity, the leadership, the organizations, we see it. We speak to people in Bnei Brith, an organization that barely can exist. Dan Mariashim, we speak to David Harris and the AJC. We had long discussions when I wrote my book about this, we had symposium, they agreed. Said, you see, we don't have a model. We don't have recruitment into organizations. If its organizations are recruited in APAC, it's all about security of Israel. But with the exception, of course, of religion, of Jewish religious groups, and especially the extreme ultra-Orthodox, for whom there is no need for a homeland in that respect because they have the portable Torah, they can move. And therefore, uh, they always see themselves as sojourners. That's how they define themselves. We can move anywhere they want. 
Sometime when Israelis tell the ultra-Orthodox people in Israel, we'll recruit you, say, so we'll leave the country. Uh, we will not live here. And I always say, well, come. I'll go ahead. But they can already not move by themselves. They get houses. They become, they have a huge challenge of serving in the army or not serving in the army for how long. The current government was moving into enticing them and pushing them into serving the army. To my sorrow, the Netanyahu government doesn't do the job because they hold them as partners in the right-wing coalition and provide for them. So don't have to do so. This is a big debate in Israel, the biggest debate in Israel. Let me get you back to indicators though. So when you say um, that uh, Jewish creativity, Jewish theater, Jewish literature, yes. yeah. uh, Jewish poetry uh, uh, is moving from the, diaspora, the center of gravity is moving from the diaspora to Israel. Uh, how do I how do I quantify that? How do I how do, how do I know you're right? How do I measure this? Look at all the, the the Jewish magazines of the United States that you deal with, important intellectual magazines. There's a whole evolution of those magazines on the right, for example, uh, the Jewish Journal in Los Angeles, the um, the uh, Mosaic, um, the um, magazines uh, of of a commentary of the past. Uh, all of them, Israel has a massive, massive presence in what they do, and that's their discussion. Look at them at, at, at on campus. It's not by mistake that we are here as part of the Center for Israel Studies. Israel Studies is now part of this avalanche in the United States to create, to move away from Jewish studies to Israel studies. The Jewish studies kind of like studying the past. Israel studies studying the future in many ways. Um, and and this is these are evidence of what I'm discussing. Now one can say no, I have my own kind of like a island of Jewish life. Of course, it's a large community. American Jewry consists of 5.6, 5.7 depends how you count. With patrimonial descent, our marriages and of course, and that's why it, it will live. But uh, but it, it doesn't mean that this life will stand in um, a powerful, I would say, um, a powerful challenge to the sovereignty of the state. The sovereignty of the state will always challenge the diasporic life or vice versa because of what it has, ethnicity, membership, Israel is a small country, family orientation uh, on all accounts. While in America, the, especially the liberal stream will be a defensive Judaism. It will not be an offensive Judaism. In Israel, sometimes it's offensive in your face. It's offensive, it's, it's, uh, it's right-wing extremists, it's uh, nativists and all of the above. Some of which was of course uh, exploited from this country. The Cayenne movement was created here You'll be surprised I write about it, how many of the settlers in the West Bank have come first from the United States. And you know, like they kind of like, with all the shifts that happened in American Jewry after the 67 war, the 67 war was a mega event for, for American Jewry. So they found something to hold on to as part of their internal American life. And they've combined their forces to help Israel, to be part of Israel, to donate to Israel. They live, Oftentimes, if they were as, as Jews, I'm not talking about as individuals, and it's the same with culture. So I see two, two, two forms of pushback in the audience. So uh, uh, one of our audience members, uh, Rena, points to the fact uh, that uh, she, she's quoting an SF Chronicle article about unicorn startups in, in Silicon Valley, uh, of which uh, 66 had founders from India, 54 had founders from Israel. And, and Rena sees this sort of as evidence of an Israeli brain drain. Oh, no, on the contrary, I show it in the book. It's the first thing that you see, this is not brain drain. The whole, while in the past, people who used to move to America in Israel, uh, people who used to bemoan their departure as the old dean, people who stepped down in the legacy of Zionism and kind of left the country almost in betrayal. Now they're all tra tra transnationals, defining themselves as transnationals, not as Americans, you will see, I did the work there in Palo Alto. They live here, but it's nevertheless, they retain connections to Israel, they are back and forth to Israel. 
and this is a, this is the hub of Israel. Indeed, the unicorn Israel is, <clears throat> as the woman who, who wrote that suggested, quite impressive. Israel is now I forgot the number, but it's a massive number in, in the world in terms of uh, uh, big companies. So when they go to the United States now, it's not migration anymore. It's transnationalism, they call it. And and uh, U.S. Uh, financial support by either the U.S. government or U.S. Jews to Israel uh, does not show that Israel depends on the United States significantly. On the contrary, we have been the, the amount of money given to Israel by American Jews has been declined almost to zero in comparison to the Israeli GDP. We're talking about a country of 500 billion a year with America assistance is around 3 billion, but mostly is for weapons that we buy in the United States. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's, it's less than 1.6% of what we do. This is no longer, as I said, the, the, the rich uncle is no longer in New York as it used to be when I grew up, is oftentimes in Tel Aviv, and in conjunction with American Jews. They're working together, lots of, uh, lots of uh, um, alliances which are built on kinship ties, but it's not that American Jews are showing sort of like the might of the money that they have vis-a-vis -a, -vis a poor state of Israel. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, another uh, student of ours, uh, Shor Masori. Um, I hope you don't mind more, more questions from students. I think they're the best the best questions of a lot. Uh, so, sure, will you will you join us and ask your question, please? Of course. Um, Turn your I, video on, sure. It it's saying that I cannot start my video because my host has disabled it. Okay. So ask your question anyway. <laughs> um. Okay. There we go. There we go. Uh, so. You've talked about the diverging developments in American and Israeli Jews, how uh, there are different histories, Americans as a diasporatic community and Israelis as a community coming back together and redefining itself has really allowed these uh, two different types of Jews to be, I guess, very independent of one another. I was wondering what were the, uh, uh, what were the largest um, trends that you've seen uh, differentiating American and Israeli Jews from one another? And which of these trends do you see uh, increasing the divide through time? Israel is becoming more what they call traditional um, in terms of numbers. There's still a large chunk of Israelis who are not traditional, very universal. But this is a trend in Israel. Um, Israelis of course, are also traveling the world a lot and they're very much uh, uh, familiar with the world. Um, while American Jews, of course, uh, have to contend, especially the young generation who is building their communities, you know, was where they build their families, where they build their societies, where they build the UJCs, uh, where they build uh, this kind of like uh, attachments for their kids, the young kids. Jewish schools, um, there's something which will continue. I don't see any reason it will not continue. But in many ways, it's more and more difficult for American Jew to remain Jewish than for Israeli Jew when he wakes up in the morning. He doesn't ask the question. He lives, the, he lives it in many ways. For American Jew, for family, when you have to send your kids to Jewish schools, I had to do it. When you have to go to a shul, when you don't have a shul, and you have to pay membership, and it's not always easy. When you send your kids to schools and, and universities and they move away and all of the above, this is a this is a, it's it's becoming more and more difficult and as as opposed to the Israeli uh, relations. So what American Jews are, I think, seeing and experiencing also is the fact that they can uh, build on to some extent their identity on the Israeli experiment. Uh, with the question that Israel presented to them for good or ill and debate them and discuss them and be engaged one way or another with some Israeli left or right, whatever it is, um, that gives them content to do Judaism. Uh, um, there is less idea that American Jews give content to the Israeli life, as I suggest should be, but it's not the case. 
Some Israelis are incredibly hostile to the diaspora, especially to the liberal wing of the diaspora. They see naivete. They see people who are preaching them without being part of the experiment. Lots of things like that happen all the time. And this is how it will continue because as I suggest, the American Jewry is large. It's, uh, it has been successful, but still, um, as we heard also this week here in, in Berkeley, many institutions have been closed. California, you see what happened. And you see it in, 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 in Los Angeles, how uh, the, um, the whole movement, uh, the conservative movement has been almost depleted. And synagogues were sold. Some of them sold to the Persian Jewish community. I was there six times for my research. Uh, very weak institutions and how to sustain, to sustain these institutions. So this is a big issue. And when there are organizations in America who are trying to build like Kibunim and others, strength of Jewish identity, they always do so in conjunction with a trip to Israel, studying in Israel a few months here and there. That's how they do it. Thank you, Shor, uh, for that question. But uh, so Rebecca Goldberg, uh, my, my uh, colleague in, in leadership of the Institute, uh, asks, isn't that just the definition of a diaspora, that it relates to a country of origin? Isn't that completely natural? That doesn't mean that Israel is more important uh, in, in the landscape uh, of American Judaism than America itself. The idea of a diaspora, indeed, as Rebecca said, for the Jews was a diaspora without a homeland. So the yearning for a homeland was part and parcel of this history. But once you normalize the diaspora, so diaspora can be defined as people who reside outside the country of origin or symbolic homeland, and as such are being called upon from time to time to mobilize for the homeland or to, to relate to the homeland. Otherwise, what is the diaspora? Diaspora is always in relations to something, to a homeland. Uh, this is indeed, as you suggest, the way it can be and should be. The Indian diaspora in the United States is a very powerful diaspora, two million. They relate to India, they impact India, they impact the Hindutva, they impact Modi. They are part, they build bonds like the Jewish bond. Uh, the Mexican Americans build many and relate to the country. But the Jewish case is also relates to religion, relates to ethnicity. The Jews are the fastest, let's say, uh, community that is intermarrying, 70% intermarrying. So they have a challenge there. I'm not saying what needs to be done here, but it's a big challenge. The relations to Israel has changed from a community that helps Israel, that supports Israel, that is part of the building of Israel from afar to a community that oftentimes uh, see Israel either as an assistant to their identity or as nemesis to their identity, depends. That's how it was. Are you at all concerned about the future of uh, American Judaism? I'm not concerned. No, it's not. I'm not concerned. I think it evolves, it changes. Uh, um, I, I'm not concerned, no. Uh, and another theme that's struck in, in many of the questions uh, that I'm, I'm reading uh, through the Q&A window um, is uh, about threats to Israel or threats, threats to Israeli democracy. And the themes he, are here either uh, the threat posed to the future of uh, Israeli liberal democracy um, by um, uh, failure to create, uh, failure to implement a two state solution, or threat posed to Israeli democracy by the orthodox and ultra orthodox sector of society. Do, do you see one of these as more threatening than the other? Are you are you are you worried about first of, all, first of all? I constantly this is a big question. I constantly worry about Israel democracy. I think there are many forces in Israel for whom the democratic idea is not the leading idea for the society, but rather the Jewish state or the nationalism or the religious part of it. And this what's supposed to take present, and that relates also to relation to ultra orthodox to women to questions, relations to the institutions of the state, the legal system, the enforcement system, the education system. So we are here certainly in a tag of war about how do we envision our democracy? Do we envision it as an ethnic democracy? It doesn't look to liberal values or do we have 
uh, something that compromised democracy altogether. We are constantly in the midst of a war politically and otherwise. Look at what happened between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Everybody who knows who knows as well knows it. So this is a big issue. The issue of the, of the Palestinians, I suggest, two-state solution or not, is a serious issue, um, but it tends to be, because they found, it's not a solution, but they found uh, uh, they are separated from the Israelis, the Palestinians. The fewer and fewer are working in Israel. The presence in Gaza of Hamas makes it very difficult or jihadic Islam, the lack of strong leadership in the West Bank makes the whole thing uh, very difficult to solve. And the relations of the Palestinians to the uh, other extreme movements in the area, if it's Hezbollah, uh, uh, if it's the Iranians and so on. So this is a, a tough, tough thing to do. Uh, the Israelis, the way they see it, it's kind of like pushing, pushing it away from them. Um, unless they live in the, the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, and that's where they can't deal with it now. But most Israelis deal with the Palestinians from afar. I'm engaged with the Palestinians as a member of the Security and Foreign Relations Committee on the border, on the fence, lots of things I don't want to discuss here. But for Israelis' day-to-day -day life, it's not, an, it's not a big issue, interesting enough. I can't, I can't let you go before I ask you about the uh, upcoming elections and uh, ask you to make some irresponsible predictions. I will not. I will just say this is going to be a very uh, important elections, like every election is important because this time Netanyahu failed in the last four times to build a government, has a chance to build a government with extreme right, no orthodox, and in my opinion, such a government will be a disaster with the values we were talking about, democracy and otherwise, and I'm concerned about it. So I'm working very hard that this will not happen, but I cannot tell you it will not happen. Uh, you suggested when uh, you and I talked to my students earlier today in my uh, Israel class, uh, that the vote of the Arab sector in Israel is going to matter tremendously. This Talk will, a little about that. This will be the number one issue in these elections. The Arabs in Israel, consists of 21, 22% of the population. And if they vote regularly, they determine the elections. But the point is they don't go to vote. They vote in small numbers, the fractured parties because of the debate on the, how much Israelization they want or not. They cannot come to agreement. The Arab community in Israel, Israeli citizens has been incredibly empowered, but also a very, very, very difficult challenges internally in, in above and beyond questions of violence and, and organized crime that have been working in the communities and issues pertaining to their relation with the Palestinians. Um, but um, if they will not come to the polls, no chance that uh, the Israel that uh, I want to see will win the elections. So talk a little about the Israel that you would like to see. So what what would that what is the what is your best case scenario for the election? Best case scenario is that the Israel, which is a free society, democratic society, that trying to navigate the Jewish identity without extremists, bringing the uh, Haredi community into the school system with what we call limude liba, which is studying core curriculum and not getting money if they don't serving in the army, integrating, including Arabs, um, trying to convince the Israelis that there is the, the collective good is there economically prospering much more, disseminating the economy into the periphery much more, empowering the women that we have, you know, lots of these things. It's, it's part of the liberal, we are, we are a party of liberals in our orientation, Jewish, nationalists, right wing even but very much uh, liberal. Who would head such a government that would, uh, would be opposed to the government of Bibi Netanyahu? Right. Who would head such a government and which parties would be in it? The, the people who would be part of it would be Laia Lapid, would be Gantz, mm -hmm. would be Avigdor Lieberman, would be uh, um, 
all the Labour Party and the offshoots of, there will be also, we hope, members of the Likud, if Netanyahu is not successful in building a government, we think that they may help oust him and will create in the Likud people who will join the government even leading it. We don't have any objections to it. Uh, and uh, the the weakness of uh, the Arab vote, uh, as you suspect in these upcoming elections, um, has to do with the fracturing of, uh, of Arab parties. And fracturing the Arab party, they fractured the night before submitting the list. You know, we have a deadline for submitting the list, which was last week. Last minute, they fracture again between the ultra communists, Balak, that doesn't recognize the state at all. And, and those who are more kind of like trying to cooperate. And Mansour Abbas, who has been in the government this time around. So there's lots of bickering and schools of thoughts and Islamists, uh, the lack of unity, lack of leadership. You don't have, they, they try to bring, asking the question, who are we, the Arab Israelis? Think about, for example, Arab Israeli students. Um, in 2006, only 6% of the students in Tel Aviv University were Arabs. 2019, we're almost reaching 20%. Massive change of integration in society of Arabs becoming part of the society in the high tech and physicians in hospitals we saw in the coronavirus. So there is a desire there to be part. And then there is the big clash, how much you can be part and live in the villages or whatever. So there is a big question there. Uh, might might one expect uh, events, disasters, or otherwise in the lead up to elections that could really change the game in an unexpected way? You know, always you can uh, worry about them. Explosions, um, eruptions in the West Bank are very possible now because there is no control in Nablus and Janine. We see there is no control whatsoever of uh, Abu Mazen, the leader of the Palestinians, who is really no power. So um, this is a major concern for Israel that the West Bank gangs will take over. Yeah, and presumably conflict uh, from Lebanon with, and Syria from, with Hezbollah. That's a different story, because Bala and Lebanon is a different story, uh, but enough for today. Yes, absolutely. So uh, more questions are pouring in, and I would love to have read more of them. Uh, I'm glad we were able to uh, take on as many as we could and that we heard a little from our students. Um, uh, Professor Shane and I uh, must leave, however, because we are uh, on our way uh, up the street uh, to Hillel for the next uh, event with, uh, with students, which is probably going to take you uh, well into the night, but at which point you will not have a voice left at all. Nothing. Uh, nothing. So, so uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you for flying out. Thank you for spending the week on the Berkeley campus. Thank you. Um, and happy birthday. Thank you so much. And thank you all in the audience on behalf of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. Uh, we look forward at uh, seeing you in one of our uh, live or uh, web events in the near future. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you.